Indie horror games is a gaming genre that has seen a rise in popularity in recent years with many creating a variety of horrors. From classics like Five Nights at Freddy's to Japanese horrors such as The Bathhouse, there's a horror game for everyone to play. However, Fears to Fathom has to be one of the best in terms of horror. It's an episodic horror series that's absolutely terrifying because of the situations you are placed in each episode. It really makes you question on what you would do if someone tried to break into your house, stalked you in your motel room, had a crazy ex-lover try to unalive you, or even deal with a murderous cult in a dense forest far away from help. With the recent release on the final episode, Woodbury Getaway, I decided to play all five episodes from start to finish to truly understand how Fierce to Fathom portrays real fear. Like Episode 1, Home Alone, places you in the perspective of Miles, where the game starts with a little narrative from Miles himself. I guess I'll start. It was in the middle of summer. My parents had left for that weekend due to a work trip, which meant I was all by myself for the weekend. Once the dialogue ends, Miles wakes up to the sound of his alarm blaring like some five-year-old screaming in Among Us VR. And instead of waking up to a portal on the ceiling with Snow Bunny Gwen on the other side, he's instead alone. Honestly, I had to pause this game for a second and go look at the mirror because this is my twin for real! Wait a second, why the hell does Gang have this in his bedroom? Either Miles is secretly 80 years old, or he's the type of kid to go, Actually, it's quite a well now. Shut up, bro! Here, let's fix that real quick. Perfect. Miles eventually wanders into his parents' bedroom, where if you approach the window, you can see... Yeah, no. Right off the bat, you can see someone is clearly watching your house. An overly snoopy neighbor? Possibly. But I'm not taking those chances and giving the benefit of the doubt when someone's watching me like that. But Miles is a goofy 14-year-old, so instead of pulling up with the machine and cheesing this family guy aw character, he instead rummaged through the fridge and watched a bunch of Vanoss gaming in the living room because your parents aren't home, so who's gonna stop you? During this segment, you can actually take a chance to learn a tad bit more about Miles and realize that you were supposed to have your day one homie Mason come over. But bro chose them hoes instead, which I'm not gonna lie, I'd scrap with Mason if he did that to me. Like, come on, have you never heard of bros before hoes? After some minor exploration, Miles finally gets around to do some homework, and apparently bro loves taking his time because it's nighttime when he finishes. Eventually, Miles does get messages from that fine woman named Rio to not be too loud. So we decide to head to bed, and this bloke wakes up at 1 in the morning going, Gee willikers, I'm sure thirsty for some fresh H2O. We proceed downstairs into the kitchen and do exactly that, and once we're done we head back upstairs only to receive another message. This is when the game takes a sharp 180. You see, throughout the game, the music and the atmosphere establish the unsettling feeling of being home alone by getting a message from our mom who got a photo from our neighbor showing that someone is waiting at the front door at 1am is nothing short of terrifying. Because the thought of someone invading your privacy is unsettling, but to realize that there's sinister means behind those actions makes the situation worse. After taking a peek from the curtains and seeing Diddy waiting at the doorstep, Miles goes back upstairs and hides in the bedroom. Now, if this entire part wasn't anxiety inducing enough, what happens next is nothing short of terrifying. Having someone watch you is unsettling, but when they're at your door and decide to break in, that's when the worst has happened. Because what was supposed to be your safe place has now been violated by someone who has ill intentions to harm you. And that alone is enough to make this 20 minute game terrifying. From this point, you have to proceed forward out of your room as your mom has messaged you that your neighbor Paula is at the front door. What's stopping you now from heading downstairs to safety is the shadow of the intruder you are hiding from. And with that, the game ends is what I would say if that was the case. You see, instead of listening to your mom and heading downstairs to meet an unfortunate end where Diddy takes you to his party, you can actually wait in your bedroom. If you wait long enough, the cops actually show up and you manage to survive this terrifying break-in where you were placed in. I gotta say, episode 1 may not be as replayable as other episodes, but what makes up for that is the everlasting impression this game gives you from start to finish. This is the first time I've ever played a game where doing the most common sense choice in a horror game results in a good outcome for yourself. Episode 1 is amazing, and it lays the groundwork for the next episodes as the quality of each episode is approved. And with episode 1 being finished, we managed to avoid going to the Diddy party. However, we are now unfortunately... Welcome to the Gulag, if you survive. Norwood Hitchhike is the second episode where you are placed this time in the perspective of Holly. The 
This happened to me when I was 19. I'm a little over 21 now. I still remember this very clearly because of how creeped out I felt. I was one of those people that loved gaming conventions. I'd go to every convention I'd get the chance to, and sometimes even meet some of my online friends. Though, my parents weren't always thrilled with the idea of me going to interstate drives, but a plane ticket would have been too expensive. Right off the bat, you start off in Holly's car driving through a heavily forest area at night. The reason for this is because this Quandale Dingless individual here didn't want to deal with the heavy traffic, so she took the back ways to go home. Me personally, I'm all for a therapeutic drive, as much as the next deranged person is, but I think I would rather deal with traffic if my drive was over 12 hours long. Though hey, maybe the whip is a decent enough- This thing is trash! After some driving, we come to a stop as we need gas, however, we do get a text from our mom asking us to pick up dog food for our homeboy Milo. Which, I gotta ask, why is mom asking me, a goofy individual doing a 12 hour drive, to pick up dog food for the dog? Is this woman extra or what? After asking to put gas in the tank, buying dog food, and having this team who blues clues Steve yap my ear out about some dumb legend of La Llorona, we finally go outside to- Hey, hey, gang! Hey! hey. Hey, what the f are you doing by my car, bitch? Hey! Hey! Bro legit walks away from my car and leaves? Yeah, that's totally not sus at all. I blame Timu Steve for this. Let me mess up his story. Alright, have a good one, man. After crashing out at the gas station, we continue driving where we eventually catch up to a car, so the initial D in me kicks in and I perform a blind attack. Here we go. Oh! No! We come to a halt as there are logs blocking the road, resulting in Holly removing the logs, but the moment we get back in the car, the car becomes a pair of huggies because it shits itself, leaving us stranded with no cell service. Now all jokes aside, this is quite a terrible situation to be in, especially if you're far away from home, and to tell you the truth, Playing this game for the first time, I was unsettled by this. But this is just the beginning of one very long night. Eventually, after a failed attempt to get help, we finally have someone stop, and it's none other than the Timu Walter we saw at the store. After a brief conversation, we finally get dropped off at a motel where I question its legitimacy because of the non vacancy sign. Well, who cares? Let's just get our room and OH MY GEEZ! He says it's the op! Oh no, it's the housekeeper. After that not so welcoming introduction, we finally get settled in our rooms. Pop an episode of Superman and. Alright crew, we're gonna play a quick game of what would you do? You see a creepy guy looking through your window. Do you A. Report this behavior to the owner of the motel B. Stay indoors and watch Superman C. Go get coffee Or D. Pull up and bring up the op stopper If you chose C, I hope you know you're the type of person to not make it out of a horror movie But you are correct! We walk to the coffee vending machine, take a soul-sucking sip out of the cappuccino, and head back Now, in all seriousness, this section right here has to be one of the most terrifying aspects of episode 2. You're out in the open at your most vulnerable, you can't read your messages, you're hearing someone talking, and above all, the controllers are jinked up so getting back to the room leaves you with nothing but hope, and the dreadful realization that anything could happen, and there's nothing you can do. At this point, you are given two options. Check who's at the door, or open your closet that clearly someone walked into. Choosing the closet ends your run as Gang pulls out that FNAF jump scare tech. However, I am a top class graduate at Harvard, don't fact check me, so I chose the most sensible choice as you can peep the curtains and see it's the motel owner at the front door. After a simple explanation, we find out that there's no coffee machine at all, but to prove what happened, we show him the coffee machine itself. Hey brother, it's gone! We soon get told to go back inside and pop some pills that are in the dresser, which leads to the final act of the game. After peeping the curtains, we see someone approach our door. Going to the door results in a very unsettling conversation with a random person where he refuses to leave and continues to beg for us to open the door. Refusing to open this door, however, will cause the stalker to crash out. We hide in the closet and try our best to not make noise while we watch in horror as the guy tries to find us.
Luckily, the motel owner eventually sees what's going on and pulls up like a real one to stomp this guy out. The game ends with one of the most questionable outcomes to ever happen in this situation. To this day, I find it really weird that the manager inferred to not get police involved as it would have affected the motel's reputation and let go of the situation. I believe that the town could have been home to a cult or a drug ring or possibly something worse. In my honest opinion, I do find episode 2 to be one of the weaker episodes in the series, but it still brings the realness of fear to the player. The everlasting idea that someone can just look at you and decide to commit heinous acts to you is downright horrible, and this game shows exactly that. Not only at the end of the game, but since the very beginning. Like the van that you pass at the beginning of the game, is also the same van the guy drives off in after sabotaging your car back at the gas station. The car that speeds off later on in the game is also the same car that's close to the coffee machine at the motel. The motel not being suitable for occupancy leads to bigger questions that will remain unknown. It's truly terrifying to know that we can meet someone and not know their true intentions. That said, never go to Norwood Valley, cause you'll never know who's watching you from afar. Holy shit, is that Freddy Fazbear? Oh, 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 For reals though, shifting from almost getting abducted, I'll be talking about one of my favorite games ever. Don't play games with me, senpai. My name is Noah. I'm a 26-year-old male from the Midwest. I have no idea why I'm sending this, but I hope my story can be a lesson. This happened to me when I was 18, but I remember this incident like yesterday, as the trauma dictated a major part of my life. Bro wakes up in some goofy-ass Silent Hill type dream sequence, and my first thought is, Gang is not, not that, that guy. guy. At the end, he has this weird interaction with his dad before he wakes up, and it makes me question why he has this sequence at all, but I'm pretty sure this is one of those things that'll just go unsolved. After the old man wakes me up rudely and tells me to get out of the car, I taunt Gang by getting in front of his car as I know he won't hit his own son. <laughs> we go to the side of the house where we look for a key to enter the house that we are staring at. The reason for that is because Noah's dad client was heading out of town and wanted a house sitter. Being a broke 18 year old bum means easy money so of course we're going to be taking the job because the client's actually none other than Mr. Beast and totally not some in-game character named Roy Carson. After exploring the house a bit, we get a message from Ori asking us to fix his computer system as it has a virus. Now being the Giga Chat genius that I am, I fixed it and proceeded to use the computer to view some of my favorite videos on the internet. I hope you were watching that in public so people can judge you now. After fixing the computer, we now have access to the house's security system. And I'm telling you this right now, it's giving me FNAF vibes. And the last thing I want is five big guys in animatronic suits rushing me with booty warrior tech. Five Nights at Freddy's, more like Five Nights at BBL City. Unlike the previous two characters, Noah has a girlfriend. And after talking a bit over text, she reminds Noah about Vanos Gaming dropping a new video. So f house sitting, Vanos Gaming is forever. Unfortunately, since we're house sitting, we are tasked to go grocery shopping. After arriving at the store, doing some shopping, and lying to the elderly over here that we're out of mustard, or out of mustard. Oh, isn't that right? No wonder I couldn't find it. We come across some high school buddies who tell us our girl was here. Except it's not our girl. They're referring to our ex, Kara, who actually has brief mentions in our text messages with our current girlfriend, if you take the time to read some of the lore in the game. Brushing it off to the side, we bike home after shopping and begin having an uncomfortable long peeing session. We eventually get a message from my friend from back at the store to search up some info on the guy who we're house sitting for. We've come to realize this is quite a controversial man because he ended up cheating on his wife. Who is his wife you may ask? Well, I'm not too sure. She's very famous, so we're just gonna call her Pokemane. Someone eventually knocks on the door after finding out about this situation. Luckily, it's not the ops, as it's the pizza guy who's delivering a pizza to us that we didn't order at all. Hey man, listen. Free pizza's free pizza. I'm not turning it down. Gang did ask if he could come in since the rain is pouring hard outside. And with that, I give one of the most sensible options to do in this situation. I know Bum's got a car. He can wait in there. Noah devours the pizza like a glizzy gladiator and continues his homework afterwards. In the midst of doing some homework, Noah receives some messages from an unknown sender asking him how he's doing. Ignoring these messages, we continue doing our homework until... The power suddenly goes off. 
going outside, we can see someone tampered with it. And Zeke, the dog, is freaking out himself. I've always said to myself that if I gotta ask what the what dog, dog doing, doing, I'm dipping on sight. Gang goes back inside and does his homework like usual until we hear noises downstairs. Checking the cameras, we can see the oven is turned on. So Noah goes downstairs to turn off the stove and acts like it's another Friday night because he's got homework to do. And I got to say, all the characters here so far, except for Miles, are not surviving a horror movie because this is some Quandale Dingless behavior. Eventually, we check the cameras once more, but this time, he sees a random girl walking upstairs, slowly checking each room until she gets to the one Noah's in. After hearing her call out Noah's name, we get into some dialogue where it is revealed that it's our ex, Kara. She's been the one who's been sending those unknown messages and the one who tampered with the lights and the oven. During this conversation, Kara tells Noah she wants to get back together. However, Noah tells her that she needs to leave, only for Kara to crash out and go full yandering mode. So now she's tweaking and giving the whole, if I can't have you, no one can. And at this point, I have to apologize to Noah because I was not familiar with this game. This guy has division one sneak nation moves as he goes and hides right away. Once the coast is clear, he dips and has his dad call the cops. The game ends with some backstory explaining that Noah met Kara on a dating app. She eventually started taking hard drugs when they were dating and it caused Noah to end things with her. Eventually, the cops do catch Kara and send her to jail for a long time. And that's episode 3. Which, I gotta say, was a better episode than episode 2 if I'm being honest. From receiving random texts all the way to the end when Kara is seen in the cameras walking, each moment shows the unknown in this game. I've already said it before, but replaying this episode again gives you a whole new perspective as you start seeing more in the background. Back at the store, Kara was actually there. You can actually see her walking to her car. Not only that, but if you look outside at a certain spot in the neighborhood, you'll notice her car is there too. It's funny, because when I saw that when we first get access to the security cameras, I really thought this was going to take the suspense out of the game but in fact it did the very opposite at no point could you see Kara well in the game except at the very end when she decides to reveal herself and the stove section itself has to be the scariest moment in this game fun fact if you don't look at the cameras first during that stove section Kara will still be inside and she'll lunge at you when you turn off the stove and stare at her. It's little details like this that make me enjoy Fears to Fathom because it shows that some choices are crucial within the game. And we'll see that in future installments as well. What was supposed to be a simple night of house sitting turned into a fight for survival with someone who has problems. And instead of being rational, they go to the extreme. Unfortunately, that is a very real thing in life and it's something we can't ever predict. And with that said, we are moving out of that house and taking a nice road trip to go meet. Ooh, fire goes. I'm Jack Nelson. I had a small job as a park ranger in a state park. I was a fire lookout stationed in one of the largest forests in the Pacific Northwest. This one time, I was transferred from one outpost to another because of some official circumstances. It was a minor inconvenience to me though, since I lived out of my RV and liked traveling. I said a few goodbyes, and I was off to the new location. We start off episode 4 of Fierce to Fathom by doing some illegal texting and driving, where we get recommended by our sister to check out a burger diner before heading to our new outpost as it has some of the best burgers in the area. Honestly, I can believe it because once we find parking, first person we meet is this guy chilling in his car, hamming away at that burger he's eating. Going to the diner, we can talk to people. Some are friendly and some are... Yeah, that. Turns out the area we're going to be working in has had a recent missing persons cases where three children suddenly went missing. To me, it seems like the forest service didn't want to mention that because I see a lack of a Glock in Jack's car. And I don't know about him, but I'm bringing the machine with me if I work this kind of job. We get back to the road and start our new job at this local state park and meet one of our wonderful co-workers. Hello? Mister? <laughs> Bro really has a shotgun with him and is ready to quap us. And this is how I know the Forest Service is nothing but bombs. Bro really says, I thought you were one of them. Honestly, I'm good with this nonsense. I'll go work a 9 to 5 at McDonald's like Deku before I work this bummy job in my life. We get our keys to the station and we continue our way to the fire tower. Once we do, we meet a friendly new guy named Connor through our radio who helps us get set up with our new tasks at the fire lookout by reporting the weather, setting up a fire, and become pro MLG players. Everything seems normal until we wake up from our sleep to use the restroom. If you pay close attention, you can actually see someone from the distance watching us. It is terrifying to know that 
someone is just outside watching from a distance in the dark. But hey, at least we have this wonderful view of the forest. If there's one thing I can say I love about episode 4, is how different the environment is compared to the previous 3 episodes. I just love the way the forest can look in the day, but at night, it feels bleak and dreadful since you can't really tell what you'll come across at night. After sipping on some coffee, we get called by Connor to check out some white smoke, so we make the hike to tell the people to not camp there since it is in the registered camping ground. Once we arrive there, the absolute worst thing imaginable can happen when you're hiking at night. I would like to believe that any sensible person would dip after hearing that, but not Jack. Instead, Bro goes and checks out the site, puts out the fire, but there's no sign of anyone, except this weird whistle in a restricted closed off area. <gasps> oh! Hey, nah, gang, get out of here. Honestly, the scream was bad enough, but getting a glimpse of the ops is not it. Either way, we head back, report back to Connor, and you would not believe the crash out Connor has about that campfire. Are you kidding me? Son of a bitch. They never learn, do they? I'm sick of these bastards. It's unbelievable. However, this is when I start to realize gang is Quandale Dingless as well. Instead of asking for more information, bro disregards what I say and says, Scream. Must have been one of those red foxes. Sound pretty much like a screaming lady at night. Nah, that was a manly scream, bro. I know what you mean. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, new guy, but I heard from the ranger. I will report this guy for the disregard of possible ops at night, but treats a campfire as an Avenger level threat. Honestly, knowing that this is the same area where the kids went missing should not be a coincidence that we heard a guy scream. We head to bed after having our own mukbang session and try to move on past this day. Nope! Not only do we hear the same whistle from back at the campsite, we get a better glimpse of who is behind the whistling. The idea of working in a forest far away from civilization is crazy, but this right here is what makes these kinds of jobs terrifying. The idea of someone watching you, and there is no help for miles. I would make some joke about his pointy ears, but frankly, I'm not going to, because this ob managed to walk the flight of stairs, get around to the only windows that can't be closed, and has been watching me for god knows how long. Getting up and looking at the window, you can see this guy move out of the way, and all you hear is his walking. At this point, the only thing you can do in this situation is just watch. As this guy stands in front of your door, placing something on the ground, eventually he leaves, and once we open the door, we can see that he placed some ritualistic shrine on the ground. I don't know what more you need to leave, but this is enough for me to dip. However, Jack is also not my twin, so he reports this to Connor, and I cannot believe what is coming out of this guy's mouth. Tell you what, new guy, it's probably best to ignore these kids messing around. I suspect that's what Marley got tired of. Bro legit called this a prank, and to well, not worry God. about it. My brother in Christ, this is not a prank! To appease our minds, Connor says he'll get someone to check on us the next day, so with that, we head back to bed. On the next day, we deal with an SOS as we can see a flare going off in the distance. Heading to the radio, we can hear a hiker who is in need of help as he's lost. Asking him questions about his surrounding, we use the map to give him directions to head back to his car. Ha, I knew it! I thought it looked familiar. I couldn't have trusted myself with this decision. <laughs> Thanks for helping me through this. I'm right here! I hear you! I hear your whistles. What? what? I see you behind the trees to my right. You're freaking me out. After getting cucked by the knock at the door, the fate of this hiker is unknown, but based on what's been happening these past few days, I believe it's clear on what happened. Opening the door, we can see it's Billy who came up to check on us and to tell him about what happened. 
thankfully. Billy here knows what's going on, but since there's no real evidence of the ritual shrine anymore, there's nothing that can be done, which I think that's fair. However, that brings up the better question on why did Gang clean it up before taking a photo? At this point, I think only Miles is the only sensible character in Fears to Fathom. Being terrified of being watched is understandable, but why didn't he take a photo to solidify that he isn't just making stuff up? Like seriously, this guy's an idiot. With that being said, Billy leaves, we go grab wood to make fire, only to get a warm welcome by a new friend. Ah, <sighs> okay. <laughs> This right here is Silas, who is a maintenance worker checking on the nearby radio tower. However, he gives us a very cryptic message and tells us goodnight. Going back upstairs, Connor radios to us and asks us where we were. So we explain to him that we've been talking to Silas. Ran into who? <sighs> Just about yesterday. You trying to yank my chain now? That radio tower's been out of service for ages now. Bro, we're cooked. Uh-uh, it's over. The fact that some dude just approaches you at night is telling us that he's working on a tower sounds very bogus to me. Most likely, he's a part of the clan and they tapped into the radio channel and have been overhearing the conversations between Connor and Jack. Either way, being told that the radio tower has been out of service should have been the final straw. Unfortunately, it wasn't. As time passes on, we eventually get woken up by Connor in the middle of the night as he wants us to check out another campfire. Getting close to the door, Connor decides to let us deal with it ourselves as he's too tired to handle this. Once outside, we use the binoculars to view the campfire. At this very moment, the view of the ops is clear, and no ordinary ops at that, but the clan itself. When I first played this, I thought it was just one guy doing terrible things wearing a weird costume, but seeing that this is the work of an entire cult is downright evil. So far, Fierce to Fathom is undeniably popular. However, this part right here in episode 4, in my opinion, has to be what made the game so well known. <gasps> if being on the radar of the clan was bad enough, getting caught lacking after trying to catch them in 4k is outright disastrous. It might be possible to escape, but one of these clan members is clearly an Olympic world athlete, because in the short time we took that photo, that exact clan member is already at the bottom of our lookout post, and with little options left, we run inside and hide under the bed. Managing to evade the cult member once he breaks in, we sprint downstairs, but we were spotted, so we bust the sprint to the porta body where we hope we aren't caught, and once the cult member officially leaves, we take this time to run back to our RV. You think that everything is safe once you get close, instead, we see one of the worst things to ever happen. It was locked. Come out of here, bro. They followed me! This to me has got to be one of the biggest gotcha moments in any horror game, because what I thought was supposed to be a small little walk to the RV turned into a final sprint for survival. And after successfully escaping from the cult itself, the game ends, and no one believes the story that Jack told, claiming that this is all a product of being isolated. This by far is the best episode in the Fears to Fathom series. The amount of uneasiness you feel throughout the game was a nice change of pace. From investigating the campsite all the way to the last sequence of running, each moment was genuinely terrifying. Not only that, but there was a lot of secrets that you could figure out from this game if you took the time to explore and experiment. At the end of the game, instead of running towards your RV, if you take the other route, you get surrounded by the cult itself. Now, you can make your own opinion on how credible this episode is in terms of realness, but the way that everything was portrayed, it feels very real to me. 
So I could believe if this is a real story from a lucky survivor of a cult attack. And with all these crazy situations happening, I think it's time to take a break and do one of the best things known to man. When I was in my early 20s, I worked at a big consulting firm in my city. Life at the firm was a constant juggle of deadlines, client meetings, and trying to prove my worth. I'm Sydney Harper, and this story takes place on one of those days. One of my college friends, Mike, suggested that we take a weekend getaway to rural Vermont. We start off at Sydney's desk, where she talks about taking a coffee break before finishing the rest of her work. We also get to see another worker staying late to finish the job, and a janitor who we had to have an unfortunate encounter with. That's creepy, gang. We go back to our office where we get a call from a guy named Mike who has been trying to call us for the past two hours on our phone. And eventually Mike makes this call awkward with the full pick me girl attitude. I've been trying to call yourself for the last two hours. It just keeps going to voicemail. Is everything all right? Oh snap. I was starting to think maybe you were ignoring me. <laughs> uh. Mike eventually reminds Sydney to rent a cabin for the trip they're having with Lily Pichu, I mean Nora. Though I will say, I feel like this whole trip is a bad idea because these two bums are on a budget of $100 a night. Like who rents out a cabin for under $100 a night? I, I seriously, that's just insane. Being the big brain individuals that we are, we did the only sensible thing when searching for such requirements. to rent a cabin where we somehow find a house that is under a hundred dollars even though it's too good to be true we make the reservations and prepare for the trip where two days later we are leaving our apartment where we see this based guy playing on a PSP. That's right, that's what this video has always been all about, to talk about the guy having a PSP. Man, I love the PSP. Go get a PSP, PSPs are awesome. We meet up with Mike and starts giving me the where my hug at statement. And this is when I start to realize this guy is a huge incel, not just by the way he talks, but by the way he looks. He looks like the type of individual to mod a Discord server and freak out and go, no memes in general, guys. And it only gets worse from here, because after not giving Gang another hug, he starts to tell me how good I look. See, this guy's clear advances towards me, I pushed the conversation back onto the trip and went on our way to rural Vermont. During the road trip, Mike had this whole deep talk with Sydney, talking about how life was good back then and missed the friendship he had with her. Bro even tries this corny talk about the snow, saying, it's like we're rushing through the stars. Oh brother, this guy stinks! After some driving, we go to a pizza place where we get some pizza and talk to a stranger who's looking to hitch a ride with us. However, there's not enough space in the truck, so we politely tell him no and bro just crashes out and gives us a warning about karma coming back to bite us. Holy shit, is that queso? You could also use some Botox while you're at it. Actually, maybe you should just work as a studio light engineer behind the camera. We get back on the road, somehow get the truck stuck. Eventually, we finally reach the cabin where we tour around as there's so much to see. This bum right here is Rick, and he's the house owner who we're renting out for the weekend. Rick gives us a proper tour of the house where he explains to not be downstairs in the basement as we have no business there. And after settling in, this incel Mike wants to go fishing, which I think is insane to do while it's snowing. And it only gets bizarre from here because after fishing, we decide to play with an Ouija board where Mike shows his true colors and dips on us when we hear a noise. Oh, fuck. Bro dipped on me. Bro dipped on me. To add on to this tomfoolery, Mike wants to play hide and seek. Like, excuse me? After a few more rounds of hide and seek, we hear a noise upstairs and find out Rick is back in the house fixing the sink. Which is oddly weird because why are you back here, gang? Once Rick is kicked out, the bizarre night comes to an end and we head to bed.
I said it before, and I'll say it again, I hate Mike. Aww. This part right here is why I hate him the most. The snowstorm picks up, and there's no sign of our friend Nora yet. Mike here tries to take advantage of this and has a whole personality shift. He starts talking about protecting me from the storm, which, mind you, Bro ran like a bitch the moment we heard a weird noise in the basement while playing with a Ouija board. Bro brings up an older trip that both he and Sydney took with a few other friends where it seems like they did more than just hanging out. This whole trip has really been for getting to hook up with Sydney, and I think that's so popular. Pega, my guy, go find a hoochie mama or something, especially with these weird odd dialogues of let me handle the details. Thankfully, the conversation is cut short with Lily Pichu, I mean Nora, sending a voice message for help as she is stuck in the snowstorm. Guys, I think I'm about 70 miles away from Woodbury and my stinking tire just blew out. Mike says he's going to go get her, and before he goes, he has the audacity to be like, Where my hug at? Oh, brother, this guy stinks! This is in the end, as later on, Sydney gets another knock at the door, and this time, it's the guy from the pizza place. Somehow, he knows we are here and asks to come in from the cold. Karma stinks, because we deny entry and tell him that he has to leave, only for bro to have another crash out. Seriously, what's with these guys in this episode being weirdos or big baby? Sydney tries to go back to bed, only to hear a scream, and taking a peek outside shows that the basement door is open. So with the possibility of some guy breaking into the house, we message Rick to come help us, which he luckily does. However, this is when the game takes a big turn for the worst. Turns out, the guy we've been talking to isn't Rick, and is someone who's been living there. For the majority of this game, I was waiting for Mike to crash out and have some toxic yandere face where we would have run away from him. But instead, it was this guy who was pretending to be Rick all along. With little to no options left, all we can do is just call him out on it. With the final segment of this episode beginning, we play a game of hide and seek with Rick, which ultimately leads Sydney into the attic. Fortunately, Mike and Nora arrive, which scares Rick off. Sydney eventually tells Rick about what happened and gets a full refund. It seems the owner knows more than he's telling, but it's a question that will remain unanswered. And that was all five episodes of Fierce to Fathom. This series has been nothing but fantastic. From the unsettling aesthetic to the realness of each situation, this game is clear on its name, Fear. With each episode, you can feel the helplessness and terror as you have to survive through the game against different antagonists. From a predator, a stalker, a mentally ill ex, a whole cult, and an intruder, this game teaches us the moral lesson that monsters come in all forms and shapes. And I gotta give props to the aesthetics of this game. Just looking at all these low poly models with realistic faces to them just adds eeriness to the game. And while some episodes in my opinion aren't as strong as others, I still enjoyed it thoroughly. But I do think that there comes a point where some aspects of the game is unnecessary. Take episode 2 for example. There's a vending machine you can drink from only to give you a small boost in running, which serves no purpose at all in the game. Or in Woodbury Getaway, where you can cash out your entire bank account. Frankly, these are just nitpicks for me. Either way, I still enjoyed my experience in each episode, and being able to play the last episode, I can confidently see that Fierce to Fathom is one of the best indie horror games in the genre. So, with that said, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. It really helps your boy on doing better with his content. Tell me in the comments below which episode was your favorite. I'm really interested to hear which ones you liked. And I know I said I was going to do Luigi's Mansion in the last video, but I really wanted to play episode 5 of this game first, so we're making a minor detour for now. Welp, that's all from me for now, crew. So, I'll see you all on the next one.